Welcome to the lecture on confirmation bias. Here's an outline. I'll give a definition of confirmation bias with you know some explanation and examples. I'll show I'll, I'll present some experiments or studies that have been done that confirm that that uh, people do tend to engage in confirmation bias. We'll look at the forms of confirmation bias, a practical some practical application, and then I'll leave you with some principles for avoiding confirmation bias. Confirmation bias is the tendency to process information by looking for or interpreting information that is consistent with one's existing beliefs. It's largely unintentional. It often results in ignoring inconsistent information, that is information that is inconsistent with your beliefs, often occurs when an issue is highly important or self-relevant. For recommended reading, you can see the links below, confirmation bias, why you make terrible life choices, uh, and then confirmation bias from Encyclopedia Britannica. Okay, so let's give an example of confirmation bias. Suppose that you, uh, you know, support the death penalty, uh, and, I, you know, I, I picked the, the pro-death penalty side. I could have picked the uh, anti-death penalty side, but you're reading through, say, the Wall Street Journal or Fox News, you're watching Fox News or something, and let's say let's say uh, they, an article uh, appears in the Wall Street Journal favoring capital punishment. So when you see that, you know, it raises your emotional level. It's a positive emotion. You feel good about yourself, makes you feel smart that this well-respected publication is against, or I mean, was sort of for uh, capital punishment. And uh, then you're scrolling through Facebook and, and you see the New York Times, they have a, an article saying that data suggests that capital punishment is not a deterrent, uh, you know, against uh, a crime. And, and you, the uh, negative emotions arise in you and you just kind of scroll past it, you don't really read it. So that would be confirmation bias in action, where you know you see something that confirms what you believe, and it boosts your confidence. Where you, and you see something that disconfirms what you believe, and you kind of ignore it or don't give much weight to it. You underplay it. It's largely unintentional. Not many people are going around saying, "I'm just going to seek to confirm what I already believe and ignore any opposing evidence." We tend to think we're smart. We tend to think that we've looked at both sides and that we've come to a rational decision. Uh, so it can happen. Uh, it does happen unintentionally. Uh, even, if, even if you're a smart person, even if you uh, do try to look at both sides, it often results in ignoring inconsistent information. So in the death penalty example, the capital punishment example, you saw the piece from the New York Times and you just kind of scrolled past it. You didn't really look at it. That would be ignoring information that's inconsistent with your beliefs. And it often occurs when an issue is highly important or self-relevant. So perhaps the capital punishment issue is so crucial to your sort of political viewpoint. And so so it's a really emotional for you. And, and when um, you see something that confirms what you believe, you get really amped about it. When you see something that disconfirms what you believe, you get upset. And, and so you're more inclined to engage in confirmation bias when it has something to do with a belief that's highly important to you. You know, not many people, um, not many people are sort of engaging in confirmation bias when it comes to chemistry, right? A person reads a chemistry textbook and kind of just accepts things as they're said and doesn't really... Uh, you know, it doesn't really uh, seek to ignore certain data in chemistry or or um, really give great weight to certain other bits of information. I mean, unless one's a chemist and then maybe one has his own skin in the game. And, and so that would be different. But if the issue is highly important or self-relevant, a person is inclined to engage in confirmation bias towards this issue. And I found this great quote by Francis Bacon where he talks about confirmation bias, though he doesn't give it that name. Once a human intellect has adopted an opinion, either as something it likes or as something generally accepted, it draws everything else in to confirm and support it. 
even if there are more and stronger instances against it than there are in its favor, the intellect either overlooks these or treats them as negligible, or does some line drawing that lets it shift them out of the way and reject them. This involves a great and pernicious prejudgment by means of which the intellect's former conclusions remain inviolate. A man was shown a picture hanging in a temple of people who had made their vows and escaped shipwreck, and was asked, Now do you admit the power of the gods? He answered with a question, Where are the pictures of those who made their vows and then drowned? It was a good answer. That's how it is with all superstition, involving astrology, dreams, omens, divine judgments, and the like. Men get so much pleasure out of such vanities, they notice the confirming events and inattentively pass by the more numerous disconfirming ones. This mischief insinuates itself more subtly into philosophy and the sciences. There, when a proposition has found favor, it colors other propositions and bring them, brings them into line with itself, even when they in their undisguised form are sounder and better than it is. Also, apart from the pleasure and vanity that I have spoken of, the human intellect is perpetually subject to the special error of being moved and excited by, by affirmatives and by negatives, whereas it ought to have the same attitude towards each. Indeed, when it is a matter of establishing a true axiom, it's, axiom, it's the negative instance that carries more force. So let's look at capital punishment and the experiment that was done um, about it. It's from the article, Bias Dissimulation and Attitude Polarization. You can find the complete bibliographical, bibliographic information at the end of this lecture. So here's the experiment. 40, not 148, but 48 college students participated in this study. 24 were proponents of capital punishment, and they believed that capital punishment had a deterrent effect, as in if people knew that they could be killed for committing a certain crime, then they tended to avoid committing that crime. And these proponents thought most of the relevant research supported their own beliefs. 24 were opponents who opposed capital punishment. They doubted that capital punishment had a de deterrent effect, and they thought that the relevant research supported their own views. So these 48 students were each presented individually with two fake studies. Remember, these are fake studies, and they thought they were real. One study showed that the murder rate increases in a state once it adopts the death penalty. And one study showed that the murder rate decreases in a state once it adopts a death penalty. So two different fake study, one favoring capital punishment, or at least the deterrent effect, and one opposing capital punishment. Then these participants were presented with criticisms of each study, as well as rebuttals of the criticisms by the authors of the studies. Again, this is all fake. What did they find? Students found studies confirming their beliefs more convincing and better conducted. So whether you were, whether the student was an opponent or a proponent of capital punishment, they still found that the studies that confirmed their beliefs, they found them more convincing, better conducted. And after being exposed to the studies, they were further convinced of their views on the death penalty, as well as the efficacy of the death penalty as a deterrent. So it didn't matter which side they were on. They went away more entrenched or more confident in their beliefs, even though they were presented sort of equal kind of uh, equal weight on both sides, either for both for and against the death penalty. There was also this study um, that was done in 2008 during the presidential election when Obama was running for president, Valdis Krebs. He analyzed Amazon buying patterns during the 2008 election cycle. And what he found was that individuals on the political right, surprise, surprise, they were buying anti-Obama books. And the individuals on the political left were buying pro-Obama books. Shocking, right? Okay, so this is confirmation bias at work. The right, they're not going to read. I mean, the few, with, the, with few exceptions, the, the right, they're not going to read pro-Obama books. The left, they're not going to read anti-Obama books. They're going to just buy books that make them feel good, buy books that seek to confirm what they already know. And again, I don't want to be too harsh. This is just, this is a human tendency. And I know um, some people actively fight against this, but 
This is what the study found. And there are many forms of confirmation bias. One form is considering only one hypothesis for some phenomenon. For example, suppose that I come into my living room and I see a pile of laundry on the couch and it's not folded. My immediate sort of inclination is to consider this hypothesis. It's my wife's turn to fold the laundry and she's not doing uh, her job. She's not uh, taking her turn on this, this uh, duty. Okay. Perhaps there's another explanation. Perhaps it's my turn and I forgot. Or um, perhaps it's one of my daughter's turn, uh, the turn of one of my daughters, and, and, and they haven't done it yet, right? So if you are considering only one hypothesis for some phenomenon rather than multiple competing hypotheses and comparing them to see how well they explain the data, you're engaging in confirmation bias. Two, seeking evidence that confirms rather than disconfirms a hypothesis. So you already hold to a hypothesis and you're looking for information that would confirm it and you're avoiding information that would disconfirm it. For example, only reading anti-Trump material and ignoring pro-Trump material or only reading pro-Trump material and avoiding anti-Trump material. Um, you know, Fox News is not going to be too critical of Trump. And if you're a conservative, you might tend to watch Fox News and ignore CNN, New York Times, Washington Post. The New York Times is not often going to, they're not often going to say when Trump did something good, right? They're going to ignore that or they're going to find some way, negative spin on it. Um, and so if you're a liberal, you might find yourself reading C the, the New York Times or watching CNN and ignoring Wall Street Journal, National Review, Fox News. Okay, so this is seeking evidence that confirms your hypothesis and ignoring evidence that disconfirms it. Three, giving more weight to evidence that confirms a hypothesis than disconfirms. So this is different. You're, you're not really ignoring opposing evidence, you're just downplaying opposing evidence. So for example, suppose you said you trust psychics, right? And um, the psychic, you go to see a psychic and the psychic tells you that you're going to experience quite a bit of pain in the near future. Uh, but on the good side, you're going to meet someone new and they're going to have an um, impact on your day, right? I mean, this is a common strategy for psychics. I, I, purposely made the um, sort of projection uh, vague because it could be fulfilled by nearly anything, right? Um, and, and that's a tactic that psychics use. Anyway, um, so you go about and, you know, you, um, you you shut your hand in the door. Oh my gosh, it's so much pain. And you're like, look, the psychic is right. That She said I would um, go experience a lot of pain in the near future. And then you don't really meet anyone new, right? So you would tend to just downplay or ignore altogether the evidence that disconfirms that the psychic is trustworthy and give a lot of weight to the evidence that confirms it. I smash my hand in the door. Oh my gosh. She said I would experience a lot of pain in the near future. Look at that. You might not, you might even forget about the thing about you forget the thing she said about meeting someone new, right? Like, oh yeah, I guess she did say that. Uh, well, I get maybe it's going to happen. I don't know. Okay, so that would be giving more weight to evidence that confirms the thing you already believe, or giving greater weight to evidence that supports your beliefs. Um, so, the article says how well people remember a reason depends on whether it supports their position. So the article is confirmation bias, the ubiquitous phenomenon in many guises. You're giving greater weight to evidence that supports your beliefs. So how well people remember a reason depends on whether it supports their position. So suppose that you do believe in capital punishment and someone asks you, you, you know, you've done a fair bit of reading on this. So you're able to list three, four reasons that uh, states uh, for states to um, implement uh, capital punishment. Right. But then someone asks you, well, what are some of the cons of capital punishment? And you come up dry, empty, right? So this is common. People tend to, they're able to list things that support a belief, but not able to list 
evidence that goes against it, not without great effort. It more readily comes to mind um, the evidence that supports your belief. Five, seeing what you're looking for. For example, Covington High School. And this is a kind of a story that occurred back in, I think, January 2019. And um, what happened was uh, that the news media had this like short clip of a, a teen with a MAGA hat on, Make America Great Again hat, a white teen with a MAGA hat on, sort of staring down a Native American who was beating on a drum. And then there were other people around who were maybe disrespecting this Native American. Well, I mean, you know, the news media just went crazy. Left and right, they were saying these teens are jerks and they shouldn't have been doing this. Later, some more information came about. Two hours of video came out where these teens started to look a little more innocent, right? Like the it was the Native American who went up to them and the boy that he went up to, he was like beating the drum near that boy and the boy just kind of awkwardly smiled and stood his ground, right? Okay, so some on the left still insisted uh, that the original narrative was correct. And they say this boy smirk, the boy smirk, he's just being so disrespectful with that smirk. Uh, whereas some on the right, they were saying, um, oh, these boys are so innocent. Um, in the news media, they just wanted to see um, the Trump supporters, you know, being prejudiced, they confirmed what they already believed. I wonder if on both sides, people were seeing what they were looking for. How can we tell the intentions of this boy, whether they were good or ill, right? Um, so anyway, um, that maybe the people on the right were seeing what they were looking for. Maybe the people on the left were seeing what they were looking for. I'll let you be the judge. And, you know, it's just an example that I thought of that might be, uh, might be good example of confirmation bias on, on both sides. Let's think of some practical application. So numerology, psychic reading, superstition. Here you're finding the meaning that you're looking for. What is numerology? It's like giving certain significance to numbers, like uh, giving certain meaning to numbers that it's independent of the sort of straightforward meaning of the number. Um, you know, finding, you know, events being predicted in um, certain numbers in certain texts, right? And uh, pretty much you can work with the numbers to find whatever you're looking for. And so you'd have to have some, you know, good evidence that uh, some numbers were, were really significant in some independent way, um, rather than just find, you know, already assenting to, to numerology and finding what you're looking for. Or psychic readings, like I said, you find the meaning you're looking for. You, you smash your hand in the door, like, oh my gosh, I went through so much pain. Um, so it confirms the thing that the psychic said, you're going to, going to go through a lot of pain in the near future. Well, that could have been fulfilled by anything. Like how often do we go through pain, relational, psychological, emotional, uh, physical? And so you find the meaning you're looking for with this. And then um, medicine. Um, in medicine, if, if a doctor or community of doctors focus on cases that confirm a hypothesis um, and ignore cases that disconfirm a hypothesis, you might think of like bloodletting, where they cut a person and the blood come, they drain the person's blood a little bit, and then the person gets better. And they say, hey, see, bloodletting works, whereas they cut the person and the person dies. They say, well, the disease was just too, you know, is too advanced and we couldn't get to them in time. Um, so you note the times where the treatment was followed by recovery and you ignore the times it didn't. And this can happen with, for example, essential oils or something. Hey, take this essential oil. You'll feel so much better. And, um, you know, you take it and you feel better. And you're like, wow, that works. But then if you took it and you didn't really feel better, you might kind of downplay that, right? And I mean, if you were already com convinced of like the efficacy of the essential oils. 
And then science, scientists hold on to theories even after they've been discredited um, because it's sort of emotional, right? Like I've been, I put my life's work into this and now you're telling me it's wrong. No, I'm gonna hold on to it. Um, so you can compare more established sciences, scientists versus up and coming scientists. Maybe the up and coming scientists, they're willing to consider more options than the theory that's been in play for you know the whole career of the established scientist and so for all of these things you know we just have to be careful to kind of um you know uh, look at the evidence from a sort of impartial way and then the media can you think of any examples in the media where confirmation bias occurs i mean um yeah, I'm, I, I'm sure you could come up with many examples where uh, a certain media outlet that claims to be impartial, either on the left or the right, really, they're just focusing on things that can, like, for example, a leftist kind of outlet, focus on things that make the Democrats look good, where the Republicans, Republicans might focus, the conservative news outlets might focus on things that make the Republicans look good. Oh, and, and then attack you know, the Democrats, and then the Democrats attack the Republicans. So making yourself look good and the other side of the side look bad. And now finally, let's think of some practical applications for us. What examples of confirmation bias do you see in your own life? What about those close to you? How are they engaging it? And do you notice it in broader culture? For example, the news, uh, social media, teachers engaging it, etc. Oh, teachers may it never be so. Okay, so principles for avoiding confirmation bias. Be open-minded. Oh, being open-minded is um, to the evidence, looking for uh, evidence um, both on both sides, uh, being willing to change your mind. These are these are virtues. However, it's it, it it's uh, I think the goal of being I think we need to keep in mind that the goal of being open-minded is finding the truth. So if you find the truth, hold on to it, even while you're still willing to look at more evidence that would come to light, to ask honest questions. Asking questions is so good. It helps us listen to others. It helps us understand things um, rather than just thinking we understand and saying the other side is just dumb, that kind of thing. Three, consider multiple, multiple perspectives or explanations. So for example, discuss an issue with someone you disagree with. I mean, do it in a civil way, right? Love your enemy, but you know, discuss some issue with someone who disagrees with you on it. If you're a Republican, make a friend who's a Democrat and, and keep it civil, like truly be their friend and talk to them about, hey, you know, like why, why, why do Democrats hold to such and such? It seems wrong for this reason. And then they could give you their explanation and, and really listen to them. Four, consider evidence that disconfirms your hypothesis, reading opposing news sources, for example. Five, give evidence its proper weight. If something really is evidence against your view, give it the proper weight. And uh, maybe you still hold to the view, but you uh, are less confident in it. You hold it lightly. And, um, you know, don't just ignore evidence or downplay it. Six, conduct the relevant research. If you're talking about capital punishment, capital punishment, you can't just say, hey, this sounds good, I'm gonna hold to that. You need to do research and you need to ask what kind of research is relevant. Empirical research, so looking at data, certainly with capital punishment, that would be true. Conceptual research, sure, that, that could be the case with capital punishment as well. Um, so conceptual research would be like a, sort of uh, the concept of punishment and capital punishment um, could uh, be relevant to whether we should have capital punishment. You know, you, maybe you think punishment is, um, hey, this person uh, needs to experience pain for what they've done, right? Or maybe you think punishment isn't just that. Maybe you think it's for the betterment of the person to help them be a more flourishing citizen, right? And so, your concept of what punishment is would be relevant here. So you conduct your, you need to conduct the relevant research. And then seven, analyze the research objectively and then draw a conclusion. 
and from multiple sources uh, over time, right? And for help on this, see Mortimer Adler's How to Read a Book, Chapter 20, where he talks about syntopical reading, where you draw together information from various sources and you come up with your own conclusion. And here are some of the sources I used, actually all the sources I used for um, this lecture on confirmation bias. If you're really into it, you can go through and read these and you're going to learn a lot. Um, so, okay, that concludes our lecture.